Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Cold, remote, and full of life, the Bering Sea. For thousands of years, healthy populations of seabirds, fishes, and marine mammals flourished in this very productive ecosystem. Humans looked upon it as an unlimited source of diverse natural resources. The bounty of this sea was believed to be limitless, beyond our ability to affect. But today, the sea is changing. Many seabird and seal populations are declining at a significant rate. And stellar sea lion populations are declining at startling rates. Over an 80% decline in some areas during the past years. Rookeries, once covered with thousands of animals, now are nearly empty. What is happening? How can a sea so vast and remote change so rapidly? What is happening to the stellar sea lions? Researchers from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and the National Marine Fisheries Service, the Universities of Alaska and British Columbia, and others are looking for answers. They hope that their findings will help management agencies and the public work to turn this crisis around. Numbers looked relatively stable up until sometime in the 1970s. And then we noticed a sharp decline occurring in the eastern Aleutian Islands. That's the area around Dutch Harbor. And from that point on, we've seen a relatively continuous decline throughout that part of Alaska, basically from Prince William Sound all the way out to the end of the Aleutians. We estimate now that there's no more than around 52,000 stellars left in the United States. And that's a decline of 73% since we first started counting animals back in the 1950s and 60s. Stellar sea lions are pinnipeds. They are the largest members of the eared seal family. Adult males weigh about 2,000 pounds on an average. Adult females can weigh over 800 pounds. Stellar sea lions evolved in the North Pacific Ocean and have been living here for at least three to four million years. Their present range extends from northern Japan, up the coast of Russia, and across to the Aleutian Islands, then eastward along Alaska's coast, down the coast of British Columbia, the Pacific Northwest, and south to California. Stellar sea lion habitat includes both marine and land-based areas. Stellars spend much of their time at sea. To rest, they raft at the surface in tightly packed groups. During the summer, they spend their time at rookeries. These rookeries are used for breeding and pupping. Rookeries are usually located far from the mainland. Steep, rocky, windswept islands where access by predators and man is limited. At the end of summer, stellar sea lions move to haulouts, where they stay through the following spring. Haulouts are used for resting and socializing. The locations of these rookeries and haulouts change little from year to year, and are probably attractive to stellars because they provide access throughout a full range of tides and are protected from seasonal weather patterns. They are also usually near sources of food and are traditionally used for many generations. In May, the mature bulls arrive at the rookeries. They select mating territories, which they defend vigorously until they depart later in the summer. At the same time, pregnant females arrive and select pupping areas, often on the same rookery where they were born and in the same location. And they usually look for gently sloping rock shelves or beaches on which to pup. This type of habitat is scarce. Competition between females can be fierce. Females give birth soon after arriving, and then within as little as a week or two come into estrus and mate with one of the bulls. Females reach sexual maturity between three and six years of age and continue to breed into their early 20s. They can produce one pup every year if they remain strong and healthy. Newborn pups are usually about a meter long and weigh 35 to 50 pounds. During these initial days, the mother and pup stay close, forming the strong bonds that are necessary for survival. 
During the summer, stellar pups grow rapidly on their mother's milk, gaining up to three times their birth weight by early fall. Occasionally, a female with a newborn pup still has her pup from the year before. The competition that results can prove fatal for a newborn. However, in this case, the older pup is willing to share its mother. In order to produce the rich milk that their pups require, the mothers must go out to sea to feed. They usually wait five to seven days after their pup's birth before making the first trip. While their mothers are out feeding, the pups lay about, often in groups. Most spend this time sleeping, but some get up to play and explore the rookery. When the mothers return, they find their pups through vocalization and scent. Each animal has a distinct call and smell, so even pups that have moved around on the rookery in their mother's absence can eventually be found if they're persistent. Sometimes the more wayward pups need to be moved to safer ground. To do this, the mother grabs the pup by the loose skin around its neck and carries it to the new location. Sometimes the spot claimed by one female is lost to another and a vacant one needs to be found. Stellar pups usually stay on the rookery for three to four weeks before venturing out for their first swim. This is often a precarious adventure. Bulls with territories are so concerned with breeding and holding their claims that they rarely leave the rookery. Most conflicts are settled without serious injury. However, large wounds can be inflicted, leaving scars they will carry for life. Most of the breeding males who have held territories and females who came only to breed and not to pup begin to leave by midsummer. The bulls go on extensive feeding forays to make up for the weight lost while they were on the rookery. Females with pups stay on the rookeries to raise them until the pups are strong enough swimmers to make the journey to the winter haulouts and feeding areas, usually in September or October. Winter haulouts are used to rest and socialize when they are not feeding. Sometimes space is a premium that must be diligently won. It's a no-holds-barred contest where those who can intimidate, bluff, bully, scramble, and climb better than their opponents most often win. Others just don't seem to care. Pods of playful youngsters often spend their winter months exploring and refining their swimming and hunting skills. Pups nurse through the winter. Weaning usually occurs by April or May. Well, we believe that there is a severe problem in the Bering Sea, and uh, the sea lions are one of these uh, 15 species that are in a state of severe and sustained decline. We don't know what will happen if the sea lions disappear. It could affect everything else. DNA analysis has revealed that there are actually two stocks or populations of stellars. Those living in the Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea, and those that live in southeast Alaska and the Pacific Northwest. In the Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea, stellar sea lion populations are declining at a rate of 5 to 10 percent each year. On many rookeries and haulouts in this area, the populations have dropped 70 to 80 percent since the 1970s. Extinction is predicted in many of these areas if this decline continues. This finding has resulted in the western stock being listed as endangered and the eastern stock remaining listed as threatened. My personal opinion is that it's a fairly complex problem, but that it started in the uh, mid-1970s, both related to the fact that stellar sea lions were at a high abundance then. And as stellar sea lions were increasing in numbers during that time frame, they went beyond the carrying capacity of the ecosystem and were starting to turn down and come back in slow decline towards that carrying capacity. At about this same time, there was an insurgence of high levels of commercial fishing in the Bering Sea. Now, associated with quite a bit of, with this commercial uh, fleet was a fairly high level of incidental take by the trawl vessels, somewhere of a thousand animals or more a year. All of these factors together are, are, are working to inhibit the decline from stopping and coming back up. Now, we will never have a cause and effect relationship, and it may very well have been totally independent of any commercial interaction. But the, the relationship is, is hard to dismiss. And personally, 
as I've said, I, I think there is a predator-prey relationship going on between commercial fisheries and stellar sea lions. In the uh, Bering Sea, eastern Bering Sea area, midwater trawlers really don't feel like they've had a direct impact on the stellar sea lion. You don't catch them. I've never caught one out here. You don't see them that close to the boats. They don't seem to be away from shore that much. If we were having a direct impact on their direct food source, we would catch them occasionally, and that doesn't happen. So our problem isn't a direct impact. We must have some kind of secondary impact, if any at all. In 1990, the National Marine Fisheries Service first listed the stellar sea lion as a threatened species. In 1991, Congress appropriated funds for the formation of a recovery team composed of research scientists from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and the National Marine Fisheries Service in partnership with people from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Universities of Alaska and British Columbia, the commercial fishing industry, native and marine conservation groups, and several other colleges and universities. The team is developing a plan for the management of the stellar sea lion to ensure its recovery while scientists search for answers to the question of why are sea lion populations declining. The research is looking at a variety of factors. Data collection includes monitoring population trends, examining the health of individual animals, conducting genetic analysis, defining important feeding areas and prey items, and developing low-impact research techniques. Summer surveys are used to monitor population trends. Adults are counted during aerial surveys over congregations on haulouts and rookeries. But pup counts cannot be made from the air at most sites, so researchers must visit rookeries and walk the beaches. Studies are done only at selected rookeries every two years to limit disturbance. The counts allow researchers to look at pup birth survival trends as compared to adult survival trends. This work indicates that the population of stellar sea lion pups is declining by an average of 11 to 13 percent per year from Kodiak westward into the Aleutian Islands. This percentage is similar to the decline of adults in the same area. Direct shooting, entrapment, and entanglement in nets were considered to have had an historical impact, especially on specific populations, but were not believed to be accountable for the widespread and continued decline today. Predation, pollution, disturbance, and disease may have had limited impacts on localized populations, but no evidence of serious impacts region-wide could be found. Researchers are now studying the sea lion's food. The collection of scats tells what kinds of fish and other prey stellars eat, how significant each is to their diet, and how their diet changes from season to season or from place to place. From Prince William Sound westward to the western Aleutians, their diet consists mainly of pollock, atka mackerel, and salmon. Pollock is the primary food fish in all areas except in the central and western Aleutians where Atka mackerel is dominant. The attachment of satellite-linked time depth recorders and the use of stomach probes has enabled researchers to determine when, where, and how long stellars spend feeding and also how deep they dive to catch prey. Important feeding locations have been identified through the use of this technology. Scientists have found that stellars dive to depths of over 250 meters and stay at sea for months at a time. However, in the summer, while the pups play on the rookery, mothers keep their trips to sea short, averaging one to two days and staying within 20 miles of the rookery. In winter, the mother sea lions may travel 120 miles or more from the haul out and may stay at sea for two weeks or more. I uh, conducted studies in the Gulf of Alaska in the Kodiak area in the 1970s in uh, the OCS program, and then again in the 1980s after the sea lions started to decline. One of the things that I did with them was measure the animals and, and weigh them, and I found that by age the animals were smaller after the decline began, which is the basis for the assumption that there's a nutritional problem in that population which is driving the decline. Stellars today, on the average, are smaller in size when compared to those in the early 1970s. 
It will be important to continue monitoring the size and weight of the animals to detect future changes. The time mothers spend nursing their pups has not varied significantly, leading scientists to believe that females in the east where they are not declining are producing the same amounts of milk as those in the western areas where the populations are declining. Pups on western rookeries are the same size and weight and even bigger than those on the eastern rookeries. And while this could be due to genetics, it seems to indicate that they are getting adequate nourishment from their mothers and are healthy while on the rookeries. Adults also seem to be generally in good health in both regions, though in many areas the females are smaller today than in the past. However, one significant difference was discovered. There is a higher percentage of older animals than there was 30 years ago prior to the decline. What we seem to have found is that the juveniles, animals that from about zero on up to about four years old, they seem to have been declining disproportionately. We used to see up to 20% of the animals on the site were juveniles. Today we're seeing 5% or less. And that's helped us focus our research on the next part of the question is, well, what is, is driving that decline in survival? And there's a whole suite of different sorts of ideas that could be doing it. And we've been able to narrow it down now into what we think is basically food. In other words, the juveniles who are going out to find food just don't seem to be finding what they used to find before the decline. So it's something that happens after the pup is born and sometime before they reappear back on the rookery as adults. Satellite telemetry work with juveniles shows that they do not dive as deep as adults. Adults can forage as deep as 250 meters or more, while juveniles usually don't go below 50 meters. This limits their foraging zone, restricting the availability of prey to feed on. In an ecosystem of declining diversity and abundance, this could prove fatal. Especially during the winter when recently weaned stellars are on their own for the first time and when most major prey species have moved offshore into deeper waters beyond the reach of these inexperienced and less efficient hunters. Researchers are looking at the stresses imposed on a young stellar during its first few foraging seasons, especially in the winter. Since the 1970s, pre-recruit or juvenile pollock, those in the four to 10 inch range, have been the major prey species for both adult and juvenile stellar sea lions in most geographic regions. They're smaller than what usually is caught in the commercial fishery, so it doesn't look like there's a direct effect that the commercial fishery removing the same fish that the sea lions would be eating, because usually they're catching much larger fish. And what we have seen is that the number of small fish, particularly these juvenile pollock, has been pretty low in recent years. So that may go along with this problem. But we know over time that the, the numbers of fish change from year to year. And there's good evidence now that sometimes pollock isn't very abundant at all in the Gulf of Alaska or the Bering Sea. What that points towards is some other food was also important in the times when pollock was gone. And probably that's some other small fish, a fish like capelin, uh, and it's a fi those are the kinds of fishes we don't know a whole lot about. But we do have some evidence, at least in the Gulf of Alaska, that those other small fish are also gone right now. In normal times, they would feed on one fish or the other, but we're in a time now when they're both gone. Thus, there's nothing for them to turn to. Learning more about the diet, movements, stress factors, and physical condition of these young stellars and of the fishes they feed on will be vital to understanding the decline. Major shifts have occurred in the abundance of fishes in the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska over the past several decades. In the past, capelin, herring, and other fishes may have played more major roles in these sea lions' diet than they do today. Are these changes due to man's influence, or would they have occurred otherwise? The answers to these questions are debatable but many of the most dramatic changes have followed periods of intense commercial fishing activities. 1.2 to 1.3 million metric tons, that's over 2 billion pounds, are taken in the Bering Sea alone. The development and expansion of this huge fishery is also responsible for the removal of many tons of non-targeted species, or bycatch. The complexity of the ecosystem 
and the limitations of our ability to determine how man's actions have affected the interrelationships within it, let alone how it has affected the stellar sea lion, is difficult to understand. It's quite easy for them to go out and collect the information that documents those changes, where they're occurring, how great they are. But it's very difficult to get the kinds of information that's required to explain why the changes are happening. One of the things that makes it the most troublesome is that if you look at species, similar species of marine mammals in other parts of the world, generally those populations are very healthy and in many cases increasing quite rapidly. It's quite an enigma that in the Bering Sea Gulf of Alaska, ecosystems that we think are generally quite healthy, stellar sea lions and harbor seals, both of which are showing major population declines. Quite unprecedented, quite difficult to explain. In response to the theory that nutritional stress is playing a major role in the decline of the stellar and that it could be due in part to the activities of the trawl fishing fleet, the National Marine Fisheries Service has established no trawl zones around the rookeries in the Gulf of Alaska and the Aleutian Islands. These closures should help to reduce the impacts of the fishery on the abundance of prey as well as disturbance. That's one of the goals of the National Marine Fishery Service now is to continue to monitor the fleet and to help the fleet in its ability to continue to be productive in its catch without uh, sacrificing the ability of stellar sea lions to, to recover. And even if the, the commercial fleet isn't the cause for the decline, there, there is still a, a necessity to manage the fleet in such a way that uh, the enhancement or the recovery of stellar sea lions is not in, inhibited. Quotas have been set on the amount of pollock and on the amount of bycatch allowed to be taken each year, with the hope that these measures will not only conserve fish stocks for the future, but will also help to prevent further declines in the health of our ecosystem. One of the major problems in dealing with the stellar sea lion decline is that basically everybody that's involved in this issue is worried about a single species. Walleye pollock people are worried about managing walleye pollock. I'm worried about taking care of stellar sea lions. Uh, seabird people are concerned about seabirds. And really the problem needs to be addressed by looking at all of them at once. And we're talking about something like ecosystem management. And we don't really know how to do that yet. We need to be concerned about the availability of, of these fish, whether they're they're walleye pollock or fish that we don't normally catch like capelin. You need to be concerned about all those species at once and how they affect the other animals in the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska ecosystem. It's fundamental to our understanding of the way these ecosystems work that we truly understand how changes in the abundance of these small fish affect the abundance of the top level predators such as stellar sea lions, seabirds, and even fish like walleye pollock as adults. If we don't look at the connections we may be missing a big picture. Uh, it's possible, for example, that the entire Bering Sea ecosystem may be suffering. And if that's the case, it's going to affect every single living thing and, and every single hu uh, human being that's connected in some way to the Bering Sea. The sea lion is important to everyone, and we need to address that issue. And it's, and it's a problem anytime you see a decline in a population. It could be an indicator that there's some other problem out there, and we have to be, take that seriously. But in the same token, industry needs to exist. The Stellar Sea Lion Recovery Team has recommended the continuation of regular census counts to ensure accurate population trend reports that additional research be conducted that focuses on the significant factors contributing to the decline, that critical habitat designation and protection be extended to include additional marine and land-based areas vital to the pupping, rearing, resting, breeding, and feeding activities of the stellar sea lion, and the reduction of human actions that adversely affect them. Both natural and human-caused factors are believed to be responsible. Historically, unintentional takes and other indirect effects of commercial fisheries, entanglement in debris, shooting, and commercial harvest may have initially contributed to this decline. Since the 1960s, stellar sea lion counts have fallen by more than 100,000 animals in the western region. But today, the development and expansion of the commercial trawl fisheries may be causing significant changes in the supply and distribution of the fish that stellars feed on. A reduction in the variety, abundance, and distribution of food, particularly for the young stellars, who are less capable hunters than the adults, could make it difficult for them to survive. Declines in seabirds and other marine mammals in the region, as well as sea lions, point to the need for a broad approach to the investigation of these issues and the management of these resources.
We need to take immediate steps to safeguard against further declines and to provide for recovery while researchers further study its causes. You can help by reducing human-caused disturbance and mortality, by supporting the protection of critical habitat, and if you are involved in commercial fisheries, by respecting buffer zones, closures, quotas, and by reducing your bycatch. Management programs must be designed to provide for recovery through an ecosystem approach and should not preclude consideration of conservation measures that could reduce human impacts. Resource management in the North Pacific Ocean and the Bering Sea and the events that occur over the next 20 years will be crucial to the future survival of the stellar sea lion. And perhaps to more than that. We do need the economic activities and it's, whenever you have human beings that's absolutely essential. But you can't do it at, at the cost of, of sacrificing everything that we're depending on. Uh, it's it's short-sighted. We as industry need to be able to work with environmentalists and I know we would. The United Catch Boats would in a heartbeat. I don't feel like we're the bad guys that we've been made out to be. We're not looking to see how we can make the most money in the next six months, eight months, 12 month projections. We project 10 and 15 years down the road. We're interested in making a living here for our lives. Why be concerned about the health of an ecosystem in itself? Well, you look at the incremental effects of destruction of the environment and wildlife and habitat around the world. You get to the point where we're destroying our backyard and if everyone else destroys their backyard and don't take action, pretty soon we're going to have a world we can't live. So, to the extent that we can make our contribution in our backyard, we should do that. And this is an Alaskan issue right now. It really is a global issue, but Alaskans can do a lot. <laughs>